Hey everyone, it's Billy from Miso Hitomoji coming at you with another poem today. I'd like to talk about the poem and then the poet and then my thoughts about the poem and the poet together. Uh, if you haven't seen our Instagram, I'll put it in the description below, but we upload Japanese classical poetry, um, sometimes modern stuff too, but we upload a poem every day with the English translation and then a little bit of explanation to give you some context and our thoughts about the poem. Uh, I use our because uh, I do this project with my wife, my better half, and we've been doing it for about a year now. We've got, I think, about 325 poems up. So if you like what you see, uh, follow us. We're going to try to upload these video explanations as frequently as we can, but you can find us on Instagram and follow us there as well. Uh, so today uh, we've got a poem by Ishikawa Takuboku. And the poem, the English translation, says, I've prayed at least one time that every person who made me bow my head would die. So that's the English. Uh, the Japanese, I'm looking at notes here, so please don't think I'm doing this off the top of my head. Uh, the Japanese is, Ichido demo, ware ni atama o sage sase shi, shito minna shine to inorite shikoto. So that's the poem, the English and the Japanese. Um, if you look at the, the Instagram again, it's got everything written out um, along with the English transliteration. So if you want to follow along, you can. Uh, the poet then, Ishikawa Takuboku, he was uh, a middle Meiji, so like around 1900, uh, middle Meiji poet. He died very young, I think at the age of 26. Uh, looking here, he lived uh, 1886 to 1912. Uh, and he was mainly a writer. Uh, he tried to be, uh, I think, a reporter. He worked for the Asahi newspaper. Uh, but mostly he's known for his writing. Uh, he contributed to a journal. Uh, I believe it was a socialist journal. I'm just looking here at the, the notes here. Um, Myojo was the name. It was a, a monthly literary magazine. And uh, he wrote in classical style, but also kind of more free verse style. Now, I don't know a lot about his life. Um, I'm never going to lie to you and say that I'm an expert on everything. <laughs> I'm not even expert at translating. I just do my best. Um, so uh, hopefully I don't have to pretend that I, I know a ton about all the different poets that we've covered. Uh, I know a lot about some of them, but most of them I'm encountering for the first time as well. So what we know is uh, he lived a, a short life. He was quite precocious. Uh, looking at his biography, it says that I think he finished elementary school like at the age of nine, and then he entered high school at like the age of 13, and he dropped out in his middle teens, like 15 years old, I think, or 16, to devote himself to writing. And he was already publishing to literary journals by the age of 13, 14. So he was quite uh, advanced for his age. He eventually died of tuberculosis. Uh, I think he was married, but uh, not sure if he had any children. I don't think he had any. Uh, so he lived through quite an interesting time, uh, the kind of middle of the Meiji period and getting closer towards uh, the Taisho period, I guess. Um, a lot of changes were going on. Uh, Japan, I think, had just fought the sino russia War, so, uh, or was, yeah, around that time. So Japan was uh, setting itself on the world stage and becoming wider known to the outside world. Um, an interesting thing that I read on uh, Takaboku's Wikipedia page is that he wrote his diaries, um, transliterated, transliterating Japanese uh, with English letters. So we call it romaji uh, when you're talking about Japanese. So he didn't use Chinese characters or uh, Japanese syllabary. He used English letters to write out his thoughts in Japanese. And the reason he did this was so that his wife couldn't read his diaries. So not sure what that means um, or what he was trying to keep hidden from her, but uh, it's something that he did. So I want to talk then a, a little bit about my thoughts on the poem. Uh, I don't want to make this too long, but uh, when you first go over the subject matter, uh, again, I've prayed at least one time that every person who made me bow my head would die. Uh, it sounds 
pretty awful, like an awful sentiment and something that you normally wouldn't want to write about, let alone like publish to the outside world. Uh, and then even further, like publish as an artistic work. But uh, the more I read this poem, the more I, I really began to appreciate it. And there is a, a couple reasons why. The first reason is, and this this sounds kind of bad, I guess. So forgive me if, if this is uh, not the best thing to say, but going, uh, like doing all these translations, these 300 or so. Uh... Now we're going to talk to Robbie. Robbie. How are you? Oh, she's so sweet. What are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, yeah. oh. How can I say it? Doing all this translation work, uh, kind of every day, looking through a lot of different poems and we do poems from you know the the Asuka period the Nara period which is like 7th 8th century and then we go all the way to like Takaboku who is in the early 1900s so doing uh, all this translation you you encounter a lot of poems and for every poem that uh we upload onto Instagram or every poem that I translate, there's, you know, four or five poems that I look at and I think like, oh, you know, I don't want to translate this or this, you know, I don't really, this doesn't you know resonate with me at all. So there's, there's uh, the balance of like good poetry to bad poetry. Uh, I don't want to say bad poetry, but like appealing poetry to me and non-appealing poetry, it's heavily weighted onto the non-appealing poetry side. And you, you'll see this too, like, going through Instagram, um, you know, you try to make connections with people and you want to support other people who are, are doing their work uh, because some people are writing their own poems, not just commenting on others. And that takes a lot of bravery. It takes a ton of bravery. Like I, I couldn't do it. Uh, I just translate. I don't, I don't write poetry. Um, but it, it's the same balance. Like, you know, 80% of the poems you read, you just kind of go like, hmm, and then you move on. And maybe only 10% or 20% are really appealing to you that, that make you stop and pause. And even going through our big list of translations, uh, when you start seeing like poem after poem after poem after poem, it, it starts to all kind of blend together. Like we started Miso Hitomoji, uh, which by the way, that, that means uh, 31 syllables because in classic Waka poetry, you do uh, five, seven, five, seven, seven lines of syllables. So that totals 31. So even our, um, or sorry, uh, going back, we started Miso Shitomoji because, uh, you know, we found a lot of value in these poems and uh, a lot of Japanese history is actually recorded through poetry, which is really cool. Uh, you can go back to almost any historical figure in Japan and you can find their thoughts, like kind of their innermost thoughts, uh, written down in poetry form, which is something that, you know, we you, you have a bit of it in English, like people write diaries and journals, but something about uh, the history of literary development in Japan led people to write a lot down in poetry form, not uh, prose form. And so we thought that there was so much to be gained from encountering these poems and that, you know, they're not just things for people who are literary scholars uh, or people who speak Japanese. You know, the, the poetry is not just for those kind of closed worlds, but we felt like poetry could be used by anyone and it could really be beneficial to uh, our daily lives. So we're trying to take those poems and inspire people and motivate people and give people direction when they need it or sympathy when they need it. But if you go through like 325 of them, just like scrolling through Instagram, it all does kind of start to blend together after a while. You, you kind of get like compassion overload or you get like motivation overload. And so when I was looking through poems uh, today for translating, uh, I came across this poem and it, it made me stop and I looked at it and like wondered, you know, why is he saying that? Like, that's a pretty bold statement to make. And that kind of led me to the second reason um, why I really appreciated the poem, which was uh, Takaboku kind of had the courage not to self-censor. And 
he wasn't afraid to say what he was thinking and not like in a derivative or like not, you know, being rebellious for the sake of being rebellious. Um, he, he wrote like a, a thought that I think we all have sometimes like, you know what, if that person there who is bothering me, if that person just didn't exist, my life would be so much better. You know, that's kind of like our, our inner feeling. It's like our id, so to speak. Uh, and then when it come, kind of comes to our civilized brain, uh, we think like, oh, that's awful. And we kind of, you know, um, we censor ourselves because we don't like that part of ourselves. But he, he kind of had the courage to go there. And so in a way, he's being a bit transgressive, but he's also doing it um, without like needlessly flaunting literary conventions, if that makes sense. So um, his poem doesn't have like a kugide, and a, a kugide is, uh, it's like a, a section of a, a poem in Japanese poetry where the, the, the poem like has an inflection point or it has like a, a turning point. Um, his poem doesn't have one. He, it just goes straight through. There's, there's no kind of like reversal or like change in, change in momentum. So that is a, a bit unique, but he, you know, he follows the, the proper like five, seven, five, seven, seven. So he's going through the poem uh, in the, 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 the proper meter, I guess you would say. But his, his thought itself is, again, it's quite transgressive. And I, I, I like that because a lot of times when you're encountering like, this is mostly in English, but when you're coming across like people who are, are writing poetry, they, they kind of want to like flaunt the conventions and they, they want to express themselves in like what they perceive to be a free way, which is great, but you don't have confidence that they've kind of like, they don't have, uh, they don't have a, a, enough of a grasp of like the basic reins, you know, the, ba the basic conventions of the craft of poetry to be like discarding them. You, you kind of want to demonstrate that you have some sort of, um, how can I say, capability or you have some sort of competency in the regular skills before you go on to like freestyling, so to speak. So I appreciated that he had this kind of transgressive thought, but the transgressive thought was still uh, framed within like a, a beautifully, aesthetically beautiful poem. So that was a, a second reason why I really, really liked uh, today's poem. So those are my thoughts. Uh, again, I'll try to upload more of these videos when I have a chance. And sorry if I'm looking in weird places because I'm just recording this on my computer, uh, not like a proper camera. So I'm staring at the, the green light, but it's it's kind of hard to uh, to stare at that and not look at the big screen of myself down below. Anyways, uh, thank you very much. And uh, if you like the video, you know, please thumbs up, follow, all that kind of stuff. And talk to you again soon. Take care.